Hello everyone, this is now our third and last video about the central dogma which is applied in molecular biology and this video will focus on the process of translation. In the last two videos we have discussed how the instructions for making proteins are written in the cell's DNA in the form of genes and these genes are used to build a protein in a two-step process called the gene expression pathway. In the first step of the gene expression pathway is the transcription where the DNA sequence of the gene is rewritten in the form of an RNA. The second step, which is translation, is where the mRNA is decoded to build a protein. This video will now concentrate on the process of translation. Gene expression has two steps. The first step is transcription that happens inside the nucleus where the information in the DNA is copied into an mRNA. Geneticists now use the word transcriptome to refer to the mRNA content of the cell. The mRNA then leaves the nucleus and goes out into the cytoplasm in preparation for the second step, which is translation. Translation is where the message of the mRNA is decoded in a ribosome to produce a specific amino acid chain or a polypeptide. Proteins, which is the end product of translation, is needed in repair, maintenance, energy synthesis, biochemical reactions, and more. The messenger RNAs are translated within the structures called the ribosomes, which is the blue figure here. Now, within these ribosomes, we will follow through a series of events involved in the initiation of translation, the elongation of the polypeptide chain, and the termination of translation. These events are similar in the bacteria and in the eukaryotes, although they may, there may be some slight differences in the initiation phase. The first structure which is important in the process of translation is the ribosome. The background actually shows a picture of a ribosome. So what are ribosomes? Ribosomes are complex molecular structures which are found in all living cells. They are dedicated machineries that make the whole process of translation possible. They do this by reading the message on the mRNA and as acting as a site for protein synthesis. The unit of measurement for a ribosome is the Sedberg unit. This rates the sedimentation of the ribosome in the centrifuge and not the size. There are two components for a ribosome, the small subunit and the large subunit. Referring to the picture, this is the small subunit, and this is the large subunit. Function of the small subunit is to read the messenger RNA, while the large subunit is responsible for joining the amino acids to form the polypeptide chain. In the cytoplasm, the small and the large subunit are separate. They are not together when they are not participating in protein synthesis or translation. And they remain like that in the cytoplasm, waiting to be used for translation. In prokaryotes, the small subunit is 30S, the large subunit is 50S, and a complete ribosome measures 70S. Eukaryotes have a 40S small subunit and a 60S large subunit. The complete ribosome for eukaryotes measures 80S. The second structure which is important in the process of translation is the tRNA. The tRNA stands for transfer RNA. Now this is an adapter molecule made up of or composed of RNA of about 76 to 90 nucleotides in length. So this is how a tRNA looks like. Now each tRNA has two important parts. The trinucleotide region, which is seen here at the bottom part of the tRNA, which is also called as the anticodon loop. The second important part is the 
site of attachment for the amino acid. So that means each tRNA is able to carry a specific amino acid. Codons are referred to as a trinucleotide sequence, so that those are three nucleotides seen together in a sequence, and each sequence can code for a specific amino acid. So what is the function of the tRNA? The tRNA transfers the amino acids to the ribosomes, that corresponds to the specific amino acid sequence in the mRNA. So that means, in short, the tRNA is the physical link between the RNA and the amino acid. Let's now start with the process of translation, and the first phase is initiation. Initiation is when the separate subunits of the ribosome, which are floating in the cytoplasm, gets to assemble at the mRNA. Another structure which is important in the initiation phase is the tRNA. It starts when the tRNA, which is bound to methionine, attaches to the small subunit of the ribosome. When it encounters the mRNA, it starts reading at the 5' prime end, looking for the start signal, which is AUG. This binds the sub large subunit of the ribosome, completing it, making the initiation complex. Once the ribosome is complete, then the protein synthesis can start. In bacteria, the process of initiation is a little bit different. So it starts when the small subunit of the ribosome attaches to the ribosome binding site of the mRNA. And the binding site in the mRNA is called as the Schein-Dalgarno sequence, which is a 5' prime AGG, AGGU, 3' prime sequence. This is located around 3 to 10 nucleotides upstream of the start codon. Aside from AUG, GUG and UUG may also be used as start codons. All of these three codons are recognized by the same initiator, tRNA. After binding, the tRNA will then start the process. Initiation also requires three proteins called initiation factors, and these are IF1, 2, and 3. These factors are not permanent with the ribosome, but they will attach at the appropriate times in order to perform their function. The main difference between the initiation of bacteria and the eukaryotes is that the eukaryotes use a more indirect process for locating the initiation point. The first step involves the assembly of the pre-initiation complex, and the principal components of this complex is the small ribosomal subunit and the initiator tRNA. After assembly of the pre-initiation complex, this attaches to the cap structure at the extreme 5' prime end of the mRNA. Now, once the pre-initiation complex attaches to the cap structure, we now have what we call as the initiation complex. The initiation complex will move through the mRNA and scan for the initiation codon. Helping the initiation complex is a plethora of initiation factors called the cap binding complex that makes the initial contact at the 5' prime end. One concern about eukaryotic mRNA is that they can be tens or even hundreds of nucleotides long, so they can be very long. That means that it's possible for several AUG triplets to be seen before the initial codon or before the initiation codon. So the problem now is how will the initiation complex know which AUG will be the initiation codon? Well, this is answered by the COSAC consensus because the real initiation codon is 
located inside this consensus, which is an ACC-AUG-G sequence. The next phase is now the elongation phase, which is the second phase in translation. This is where there is the formation of the growing polypeptide chain. This is done with the help of tRNAs, which transfer the amino acid from the environment going to the ribosomes. The ribosomes have three sites, the E, P, and A site. E is for exit site, where the tRNAs will be released. P is for the peptidyl site, where the growing polypeptide chain will be seen. And A is the acceptor site, where the next tRNA will be received. As the ribosome moves forward to the right, the tRNA in the middle will be moved to the E site. The A site then becomes available and empty and ready to receive the next tRNA that matches the codon in the next sequence. The amino acid on the acceptor site will then make a bond with the polypeptide chain in the second site. As the ribosome moves forward, the tRNA on the A site will transfer to the B site, holding the growing polypeptide chain. In eukaryotes, the deacylated tRNA is simply ejected from the ribosome. But in bacteria, the deacylated tRNA, so these are the tRNAs with no amino acids, departs via the third position, which is the exit or the E site. After several cycles of elongation, the start of the mRNA is no longer associated with the ribosome, and a second ribosome may attach and begin to synthesize another copy of the protein. The end result is a polysome. So a polysome is an mRNA that is being translated by several ribosomes. The last phase in translation is termination. Termination is when the protein synthesis stops. And this ends when one of the termination codons, which is UAA, UAG, and UGA, enters the A site of the ribosome. There are no tRNA molecules with the anticodons able to base pair with any of the termination codons. Instead, a protein release factor enters the A site in order to terminate the translation. Once this happens, the polypeptide chain is released and the ribosome dissociates from the mRNA. There are three release factors in bacteria. RF1, 2, and 3. RF1 recognizes the termination codons UAA and UAG, while RF2 recognizes UAA and UGA. RF3 stimulates the dissociation of both RF1 and 2 from the ribosome. There are only two RFs in eukaryotes. RF1 recognizes the termination codon, while RF3 possibly stimulates the dissociation of RF1 from the ribosome. Let's now go to the different post-translational processing of proteins. Translation results in the synthesis of a polypeptide, which is a linear chain of amino acid. Now this is an inactive protein, and for a protein to function properly, it needs to be in its active form. An example of this is an antibody. An antibody is an immune system protein which binds to foreign molecules on one end and recruits other immune system proteins on the other end. That is why the Y shape is important. We therefore have to convert the newly synthesized protein into a functional protein. Examples of post-translational processing would be protein folding, chemical modifications, and proteolytic cleavage. Protein folding is the most important part of post-translational processing. 
This is the physical process leading from an unfolded polypeptide into a functional protein with a definite structure. An advantage of this is that it minimizes the number of hydrophobic side chains exposed to water. The folding process depends on the solvent, the salt concentration, the pH, the temperature, and molecular chaperones. Chaperones are proteins that facilitate the folding of other proteins without being part of the assembled complex. There are four levels of protein structure. The first of these structural levels is called the primary structure. This is the linear sequence of amino acids. The next level is the secondary structure, which refers to the different conformations that can be taken up by the polynucleotide. The two main types of secondary structure are the alpha helix and the beta sheet. These are stabilized by, mainly by hydrogen bonds that form between the different amino acid peptides. The tertiary structure results from the folding of secondary structural components of the polypeptide into a three-dimensional configuration. The tertiary structure is stabilized by various chemical forces, notably the hydrogen binding between the amino acids, electrostatic interactions, and hydrophobic forces. There may also be covalent linkages called disulfide bridges. And finally, the quaternary structure involves the association of two or more other polynucleotides that have been folded into their tertiary structure. This results in a multi-subunit protein. Not all proteins form a quaternary structure, but some quaternary structures are held together by disulfide bridges. Some proteins also undergo chemical modifications by the attachment of new chemical groups. The simplest types of chemical modifications occur in all organisms and involve an addition of a small chemical group. Example, an addition of an acetyl, a methyl, or a phosphate group. Other modifications may also be the addition of sugar side chains, lipid side chains, and the addition of biotin. A more complex type of modification, which is found predominantly in eukaryotes, is glycosylation. There are two general types of glycosylation, the O-linked glycosylation and the N-linked glycosylation. Another PTM or post-translational method is proteolytic cleavage. This is basically the process of breaking the peptide bonds between amino acids and proteins. This process is now called as proteolysis. This process is carried out by enzymes like peptidases, proteases, or proteolytic cleavage enzymes. These cutting events may remove segments from both ends or from one end of the polypeptide, resulting in a shorter protein, or they may cut the polypeptide into a number of different segments. And that ends our three-part lecture regarding the central dogma used in molecular biology, where a genome from the cell is transcribed into a transcriptome, then translated into a proteome, and after post-translational modification, different types of protein, functional protein species, are produced for the body to use. And that ends this video about the central dogma used in molecular biology. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you learned a lot. Bye!